you know, personal session, do feel, obviously feel free to talk about anything, uh, ask anything. So I'm Cindy Klusky. I am the president of Big Big Design, and I um, build websites for a living and do social media and blogging. I was one of the founders of, pod, of um, Pittsburgh Bloggers and one of the early planners of, of PodCamp Pittsburgh. But as a founder of Pittsburgh Bloggers, um, we started that because there were a lot of bloggers all over the place who wanted to get to know each other. And blogging's been um, pretty lively in the Pittsburgh area since you know since it's uh, you know the early part of of this millennium. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today, though, is even though it's, it's been around a long time, there are still people who aren't sure how to get started, or there's different tips that you can do. So we are going to kind of talk through some of those. And I have notes. In a session like this, sort of a one-on-one -on -one session, people would say, why blog? And I am actually not going to spend a lot of time talking about all the reasons why people blog. Some blog for creativity, some for business. Um, there's a, a million different reasons. And so I'm not going to talk about all of that, because I figure if you're here already, then you already have your reasons for doing it. But I just want to talk instead about the importance of thinking about why you want to blog. Part of my philosophy is, um, you can spend a lot of time planning and prepping and um, figuring out the whole sort of strategy and things. Uh, and for certain projects, that's important if you're building a house, for example. But for building a blog, I think that a lot of the planning and prep that people do is more sort of hemming and hawing and throat clearing and not so much um, keep keeping yourself from actually getting into the work, especially when you're talking about creative endeavors, but even for business. So there's sort of this hesitation. We want to make sure we do it right. For blogging, I think in particular, it's useful just to sort of get in there and start doing it, and then you're going to see as you go how it's going to need to be. So I'm a real fan of just sort of diving in. And even so, there is sort of a minimal, sort of least level of planning that is worthwhile doing. And that least level of planning is just really asking yourself a few questions. Um, what is it that is sort of articulating? What is it that is inspiring or causing you to blog? Who is your blog for? And where would you like to see this blog go? Like, what, what can you envision about it? When I say thinking about these questions, I actually mean sort of sitting down and writing them out, writing out the answers to them. Because forcing yourself to write them and articulate your answers makes you think about them a little bit harder. And sometimes you might discover that you've got multiple reasons for starting a blog. And if that's the case, it can be helpful to kind of push past the first couple of reasons to the real reasons behind it. I see this when people say they want to start a blog and then they kind of don't feel like they can explain why, they just sort of know they want to. But sitting down and sort of saying, well, who am I imagining reading it can help answer the question of why you're writing it. Or it, you know, sometimes we say, I, 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 I write something to discover what I'm thinking. You know, if you, if you start to write down your reasons for it, then you kind of get past that early stuff. But more importantly, as you'll see in a minute, Coming up with, the, with your reasons and, and your, your motivations behind it will help later on with some of the decisions as far as building the blog go. So far, so good. So the next thing that you need for a blog is a name. Now, um, you, you need a name, and yet the name is sort of kind of really important and kind of not important at all. Um, it, it, when you think about um, first impressions, you know, a name can help someone sort of, it can sort of set the tone of a first impression, and a name can also be memorable, so people can recall you later. But in the long term, the name might not be as important as you think. So for example, think about Google. So when Google was new, the name um, was sort of interesting because it was a little bit fun to say, and it was sort of memorable. And it's a little bit like Google, G-O-O-G-O-L, which is, what is it, it's um, 10 to the 100th. Um, and so it sort of had this meaning of like very large numbers, although I, I believe that that's sort of not so much the reason why they picked it. So it seems sort of important at the time, but now like the word Google just means a big company 
or it's a verb needing to search on the internet. You know, so the name is now actually kind of not as important. Although ironically, now they have to work harder to defend the name. But so, um, uh, so the name in the long run of your blog will not matter as much. But at the beginning, it can kind of help yourself remember why you're creating it, um, and it can give you um, some context, and it can give people some context as they are looking at your site. So, but one one way or another, you actually have to have a name just because it needs to have a name. Hello. Since we're such a small group, what's your name? Bill. Bill. And do you have a blog already? Yeah. Okay. Um, and please have a seat. So far, we've just been talking about um, the, it's useful. I'm going to just roll it back for a second. It's useful when you're starting your site to ask yourself why you're starting your site. Okay. And that's going to be important because later on, that will help you. It'll simplify some decisions about building the site. Okay. And you do need a name. Um, and the name is sort of important and not very important at all. Just pick a name of any sort. Okay. But the real reason why you need a name is because people have to be able to find your site. And so you're going to need to register a domain name. And the domain name can be like the name of the site, or it can be a shortened version, or just a person's name. It can be anything. Um, it's basically the address by which people find it. So when, you, when I say you, you have to register the site, how it works is this. All the stuff on the internet has to have labels, which are the domain names, and you register them with registrars, which are companies like GoDaddy. You guys are familiar, both familiar with GoDaddy? So GoDaddy, people like it or don't like it. I, I find that for its you know, cost versus value, it's fine. It seems like they're trying harder to be less controversial and to be more publicly minded. They're easy to use. Um, and, they, and they don't tend to um, go astray too often. So I, I think they're fine to use. But any registrar will probably be a you do need to pick where you're registering it and register it there. Um, and that's a, you know, a yearly fee to renew the name registration. So that is the one cost you kind of can't really avoid. But I do strongly recommend that even if you're going to go with a service that gives a name to you, that you still register your own name so that if you move your blog from one place to another, the name will still point to it so people will be able to find you all the goodwill that you've generated in the search engines will travel along with your site. It's supposed to have you start from scratch. It's just worthwhile to have the name. It's kind of like having a, your cell phone number and you switch from provider to provider, but you still have the same number. So, so you have a name and you register it with someone or other. Um, maybe fifteen dollars a year, something like that. It's not really, not really a problem. A couple notes on domain names, though, as you're thinking about them. Um, uh, so it's good to have a memorable name, a name that people don't mind saying. Um, but um, people often ask me, do I need to have a .com name? More and more, that isn't as important. The more businessy you're going to try to be, the more useful it is to have a .com. Um, but over time, you know, because we're just we're sort of running out of them, I mean, there's an infinite number of them almost, but there, there's not really infinite. Um, other names just become more acceptable. So it's fine to choose a different top-level domain, .info, .me, as we talked about, uh, .co. Um, all of those things are more and more acceptable. Uh, some of the domain names are quite expensive, like .tv, for whatever reason, is like $35 a year instead of $15 a year. And so I don't really like to recommend people get them unless it's a really big part of where your mission is, you know what I mean? So um, don't spend a whole lot of money, and I wouldn't worry about getting all the different variants that, you know, get the .com and get the .org and get the .info. I don't think I would bother if I were you. And this is what I advise my clients as well. One thing that I do strongly recommend, though, is that you do not choose a domain name that has punctuation in it, like hyphens or underscores. Because those are just opportunities for people to mess up when they're trying to find you. I mean, most of the time they're going to, you know, go to Bing or go to Google and search for you, and they'll find you no matter what your name is. Um, but if they're typing something in, you would like it to be easy for them to spell, hard for them to misspell, and hard for them to confuse with another site. So, as much as possible, um, choose a name that is straightforward. That you can you can tell someone, you know, you can explain them how it is, all lowercase or whatever, all one word lowercase. Those kind of phrases are easy for people. At this point about domain names. So we have a name, 
and the name's going to travel with us, but the site has to exist somewhere. And there's basically two options when you think about where a site lives. The files and the data have to be somewhere. You can be in charge of where they are, uh, you know, take care of it, or you can not. It's a little bit like owning a house versus renting a house or an apartment. So if you, um, it's important to you to own the space and be able to add on later if you want to, um, and to take all the decisions yourself, then you need to buy. And if you don't really want to do so much maintenance, you don't want to worry about having to keep the plumbing and the heating and so forth, and all you want to do is just live there and be happy, then you want to rent. So um, hosting is the same way. Um, if you want to um, be able to expand the features of your site later on and have full control over it, and you are capable of doing a little bit more technical stuff to back it up and deal with problems if any spammers or malware or anybody ever come in, then it's fine to host it yourself. And if you are pretty sure that all that technical stuff sounds awful, you can either pay some, someone to, to do those things for you, or you can find a service that will host the site for you. So that's a simple analogy. Um, if someone is just starting out with a, a site, um, what I often recommend, particularly if they're just kind of getting the feel of it or they're doing something for a personal reason, um, then I would say go with a hosted, hosted solution. Because um, you can always move it away and move it to a self-hosted thing later on if it expands and you discover, wow, I've, I've, I've taken off and I'm going to start selling merchandise and doing all these other things and I want to have more control, then you can always export your site and put it somewhere else. So, so in the absence of other choices, just start with your own, um, with a hosted solution where they're taking care of it, like the renting the apartment. So the solution that I'm going to suggest is WordPress.com. So WordPress is a chunk of um, uh, website software, and there's basically um, a version that you can just download and put on your own space if you are posting things yourself. Or um, there's a company called Automatic that um, using WordPress.com, they run it for you. And so all you need to do is set up your site and start using it. You have less control, you have fewer design choices, and fewer, you can only add in the extensions that they've approved. So that's where the limits are. Um, but it's also, at one level, free. And so that's nice. And you don't have to worry about fending off spammers or malware or any of those things quite as much as you would if you owned the customers. This make sense? So, um, so I do recommend WordPress.com as a way to go about it. It's easy, it's simple, and um, you can have a whole bunch of sites there if you want to, and they can be in different levels of um, control. When you start it, you're going to end up with a, you're going to start putting, start it with a name like, you know, myawesomesite.wordpress.com, but you've registered your domain name, so WordPress will let you, for, I believe it's $10 a year, use your domain name. So now you're paying two things, you register it, and then you pay WordPress's fee to say, I map my name to this hosting. But then that's all your cost, and you just renew that every year. Um, otherwise, if you're hosting it yourself, then you are going to pay sort of a, a fee every month to, to handle it. So, so far, so good. I, so, so that all sounds really, really great. Um, what's, what I like about this, too, is that you can start your site up and you immediately start blogging. What I find, though, is that when people start their blog, they do not immediately start blogging. And, uh, that what they want to do instead is like spend time looking at different designs and choosing different fonts. It's very, very like if you had to write something in you know, Word or any other word processor and you spend some time choosing your font, adjusting your margins, picking out your style. So, um, so here is what I suggest for people. WordPress.com actually, when you first start, this is the design you get. You know what I mean? This is literally how your site starts out. It is um, using a default theme, but you don't have any pages really, you don't have any blogs, and so it's extremely empty. And so it's a natural thing to start your site and then immediately want to start making a design that really represents you and your site much more. And so what I suggest when people start a site is that then they um, go away from the computer as much as possible and like pull out an actual piece of paper and a pencil and write your first blog post. 
So write it away from everything else, because that will let you focus more on what it is you're trying to say and less on how things look, the distracting stuff. Do you know what I mean? So if you start out instead, you know, writing your first post, it can be very short. Um, you may be just you know, going out and taking a photograph and writing a few notes about where you took it or what it's about. But go and create your first post first, and then when you go to choose design, you will have some context for that design. You'll know what that design has to go about. You'll have the beginnings of a sense of what your blogging will be like. So it's going to make the design choice much, much easier. So the assignment is to register a domain name and then start an account on WordPress.com, maybe tie them together right away. The steps are fairly clear. Um, the help that they give on WordPress.com is very good. And then step away from the computer um, or close the browser and open up Word and write your first post. So then you can go back and look at the you know, bland thing and click on either this link here, which is going to lead you to writing your first post, or that link up there, new post. And neither of those is going to take you into the editor. This is what the editor looks like. This is the newer editor. If you've used WordPress before, um, this is their new design. And their new design is, is, again, to sort of give you less stuff to worry about while you're creating your post. But anyway, it's pretty simple. Um, when you're writing your first post, so even though you've written it somewhere else, first thing you're presented with is this bit up here, which is to write the title. Again, skip that and jump into the content part and type in your post or paste in your post. And then once you've got that written down, you can go and give it a title. And then click this button here. This is the magical publish button. And now you are a blogger. It's easy as that. Suddenly you are a blogger. And now you can start thinking about design. So the design of the site, um, once you've done that, there is a, a place to play with the design. There's um, in the dashboard of, Word, of WordPress, when you're in there, there's going to be a button here, dashboard. If you hover over the name of the site, if I were to go back, so this design, if you hover over that name, then it's going to give you this menu, which is your main menu for doing stuff in WordPress. And what you, you've already created your first post. Now what we're going to do is to go to, I believe it's customize here. Oh, so farther down is appearance. Oh no, click here to get to dashboard. And then you get this other bigger menu. And then you click on appearance and then themes. That's what they call the designs in WordPress is themes. And then once you're in themes, it's going to give you a whole bunch of different designs. It does not give you a very helpful way to search through them based on, say, color or layout or anything, which is unfortunate. Um, but then you can skim through and sort of get a sense of what the different designs look like. And the nice thing about this is you can go through, you can pick a design and try it out for a couple days, write another blog post, see how you feel about it, and then change again without having to redo all the other stuff. My, just my feeling, my, um, what I found with people as they start blogging is that they do end up going through, it's a little bit like being in high school. You go through different personalities before you figure out who you are. Um, and so the same thing happens when you're choosing designs, and when you're, even when you're writing blog posts. And so that's perfect. It's good to know that it's okay to do that. But, but, um, but basically, it's important basically to get away from the boring design that you have right now and just choose something a little bit more interesting. It's a very long list that they have. So far, so good. Jeff, as you're thinking about explaining this to some of your students or some of your colleagues, maybe mm -hmm. even more, do you feel like they're going to get this part? Yeah. This part, I think, is uh, it's a, the interesting thing that I think a lot of people uh, are getting caught on the, I mean, first of all, anytime some of the faculty, or at least 50 or older, see a huge uh, list of things like that, they panic. That yeah. It's that moment. Um, the students, not so much, but um, that was the thing when we had the faculty session. People, uh, the faculty wanted to like, click on everything all at once. They right. didn't want to go slowly through things. Right. They were very impatient listening to the person talking and just wanted to get in there and click. And frankly, most of them are writers. Yeah. And so they, the thing is they want to get in and do the thing they already know how to do, which is yeah. write, yeah. as opposed to the thinking out and framing it. 
Well, so I don't feel like that their instinct is bad there. No. But if they're trying to be, if someone's trying to train them, yes. and I'm not, they're not going to be back again and again, right. then I can see that problem too. Yeah. One, one, one thing that might be a good resource then for the department is knowing that there are the tools and stuff in, even if you're using hosted WordPress, I mean self-hosted WordPress, where, you're, where the school is setting up the sites and uh, so forth, the, the uh, WordPress.com has videos you, that still apply because WordPress is WordPress. Right. Um, some of the stuff won't quite, but most of it will. And the um, explanations and the documentation of videos, I think, help a lot of people. And it's nice that they're both written videos and uh, written documentation and video right. documentation because some people, right. you know, people have different learning styles. And but, we also, sorry, uh, but we uh, yeah, I don't know if you this, but uh, we have subscribed to Linda. Oh, which yeah. Which is this huge. Yeah. That basically you can get a video for anything you want to do. The challenge of it, because they keep changing the interface, which they're trying to make it better, yeah. you know, but it, it's very confusing to look at an old video and then have to map, particularly the people who oh, most need yes. it are the ones who are going to have trouble in their minds mapping from one to the next. Right. And so the nice thing about the WordPress.com is they're trying to, they, they are, of all the people, most likely to keep current. Yeah. But I think giving, an illust you know, screenshots like this helps, yes. to, helps a lot too. So I would recommend that. I've gone and flaked on your name again. I'm sorry. Yeah. Bill. Yeah. And so most of this is pretty straightforward to you. Do you Not see good. it? You're all good. So WordPress does guide you through all of the customizing and so forth. Um, and so one of the, again, the advantages of using a WordPress.com where the designs are all pre-selected is that they've also had to pass through all this vetting and approval process. And so they're going to follow the rules and not be weird. Um, they also won't have quite the flexibility that you could get in a custom design or a design that you bought off of, say, Theme Forest. Or, you know, I buy a lot of sites there, of designs there for clients of mine. Um, but they can be hard to configure because everyone does it their own little way. And the stuff that's on here is going to be more straightforward. And they'll have little guides. It's, it's, it's useful to do. So for people just starting out, I recommend. Usually there's ways to adjust the colors and the designs and to choose fonts. And the interfaces for these are pretty similar. So it's not too hard to play with. So uh, what I suggest is like setting a time limit for how long you're willing to play with a thing and then stopping. Um, because you'll find that it's so easy to keep doing this and not to actually write the next post or do the next thing. Okay. Now, you know, you've got a blog post or maybe two Basically, you are a blogger and you can launch. You can make the site visible to people. Launching is really no more, no less complicated than deciding you're ready for anyone to look at it, even if you're doing sort of a soft launch like in the restaurant world where you just tell a few people to give you feedback. Um, I do suggest putting a page that is about you and a way for people to contact you. So those are two things that, are, that I see people forget to do. They don't say anything about themselves um, or you don't need to give a big, like, why I'm writing this blog post, but just sort of, I am this person, this is my name, I'm in this city. The very short bio, even a little one is helpful, a photo is always helpful. Um, and then a way for people to get a hold of you, because, you know, what if Oprah, or I guess now it's really more, Ellen decides that that's something you've written is really inspiring and wants to share it out with the world. Well, my goodness, she should be able to let you know. So, um, but launching is really no more complicated than, than letting people know that you exist. Um, the more important part is to keep writing it. And so, um, and if you, as long as you're doing that, writing with some regularity, even once a month, then you are going to do great. So, what I suggest people not worry about a whole lot would be um, like choosing making a logo or something for yourself. At the beginning, it's much more important to, to keep blogging and finding out what your voice is and finding out what you're writing about by doing it than to spend time on a design. You can come up with a logo next year, it's fine. Um, people also ask me, do I need to copyright these things? Do I need to trademark my site? Again, when you're first starting out, I, I wouldn't really worry about it. If you were able to get the domain name, a, a domain name that matches what you're doing, then probably, probably whoever, there's nobody else trademarking that same thing. If you were able to think of something new enough that you got a domain name, free and clear. So, um, I have a few questions that people commonly ask me, but then, you know, we have all sorts of time. I'd be happy to just sort of talk about things much more advanced than this, um, or much more simple, or whatever you'd like. 
people ask me a couple things. Um, how often should I post? And um, how much should I write? So how often you should post is however often you have something to say. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes you don't know you have something to say until you, until you start writing it. So I find it useful to choose a, a regularity that you'd like to post. Um, people often will do like a blogging month in November, for example, where they write a blog post every day in November or January or some month that they choose. November is very popular for those kind of things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so writing a post every day is an amazing discipline. It is so interesting because you find yourself at 11 o'clock at night thinking, I have not written my blog post today. I have nothing to say at all. And just starting to type the words, I have nothing to say today, but this happened. And then all of a sudden you do have a little essay. Well, you talked about the creativity before in your journal, that kind of a thing. And choosing to um, post that to the world is also a learning experience, like learning to free something and put it out there even though it feels very rough. There are some longtime bloggers who have uh, no delete Thursday. So if they <laughs> type something on Thursday, they don't correct it, they don't fix typos or anything. So that's an interesting discipline as well. There was a time um, when I, uh, uh, several years ago now, on, in November when I was doing blogging every day in November. And I didn't have anything to do, but I had babysat my niece earlier in the evening. And she was very small. And she was at this age that I think a lot of kids go through where they put pots on their head all the time, like they go and spend time in the cupboard in the kitchen. And so we, she and I took a picture of ourselves with little metal bowls on our heads. And I didn't have anything else to do, so I posted that as a blog post. I titled it Pretty Hats. And that turned out to be like a massively popular post. People always love pictures with cute little kids, of course. Um, but also, Pretty Hats then was like the top, like if you Googled Pretty Hats, that post came up. You know what I mean? So like a top of any, anyone buying hats at Macy's or something like that. So you don't know what's going to be interesting. You don't know what's going to be fun until you do it. But so I, I suggest choosing a, a, a frequency to post and then just holding yourself to it and watching how your traffic goes rather than saying, I want to do this, and so, and if, assuming that there is like a rule that will apply to get you there. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then how much should I write? Um, again, it's kind of good to experiment and, and try different things. Um, what I have found sometimes is when I am giving myself sort of like, I'm going to write long essays, people will tell me then, yeah, I didn't read your blog because I didn't have time. They knew that they liked it, but they it was like a long read. Um, the site medium.com now, um, you know, they, they tell you about how long some people take to read. And I think that that's part of why, because people feel like, you know, I don't have 15 minutes right now, I only have two. And so it can be useful to mix it up a little bit and to see what, what your style and speed is. I mean, some people are going to be Dave Barry's where they're always writing a certain length of column. Um, and other people, uh, there's one blog that I love to read. She doesn't blog as much anymore. It, her blog is called The Shortest Blog in the World. And it's usually like the title of a post and then maybe one more sentence and then that's it. But because she's choosing, it's like almost like Twitter. She's choosing what she wants to write about very succinctly and she has a, a certain wit. It's always a delight to me to see that. It's like, it's like coming across a comic or something. It's just one small thought. So there's not really a best length. Um, but you find over time, as you notice which things get most comments, or most retweets, or most visits, um, which are the most popular, and you'll find yourself wanting to do those more. Um, then I get a couple of questions about comments. What should I do if someone comments on my site? Or what should I do if no one comments on my site? And so both of those are um, interesting problems to have. I wouldn't worry about having no comments on my site at all. Because think how hard it, I mean, how often you read something and you don't respond to it. So I don't worry about not getting comments or not getting retweets. If someone comments on something and you don't know how to respond, yeah, you. you don't really have to respond. But it is useful yeah. because that lets people know that they, what they said was worthy if they've gone to the trouble of, of doing it. So I do recommend, it's not just possible, but at least say thank you for your, your thoughts. I hadn't thought of it that way. If someone says something really vitriotic and, and awful on your site, um, it is perfectly okay to take it down because it's your space. That's your privilege. And then the last question that I get most is how um, do I make an anonymous blog? It's very hard to make an anonymous blog. 
because it is um, very easy for anyone to see lots of things about it. You have to do, I mean, it's, it's not impossible, but usually you have to have a go-between. Someone is going to be the person between you and the world. And that person is a trusted person. So um, you can be anonymous a little bit, but eventually someone's going to spot something if, if they really care about it. So, um, so when people ask me to, if, how would I make an anonymous blog, I often ask them why. And sort of, it's more interesting to know why they're trying to do it that way. You can use a pseudonym for a while, and then you wouldn't buy a domain name, or you'd have someone else register the domain name for you, but you have to trust them to hold it up. Um, but if there's something that you're trying to do anonymously, um, it's important to be aware that you may be revealed, and to just be ready for that to happen. Several people have talked more about this issue. So here in Pittsburgh, we had um, um, Jane Pitt, uh, Pitt Girl, um, she had a go-between, who was uh, Mike Wojcik, one of the, again, one of the founders of Pittsburgh Bloggers. Um, and at the very beginning, she was anonymous because it was easier, a little bit easier than was people didn't track things down. And then she had him sort of be her butler, as she called him, uh, her technical um, guru, and then he kept the secret of who she was uh, for a little while. But eventually then, it's still, if someone becomes determined, they're going to find you out. So it's very hard to be. So those are the questions that I get the most, but are, are there things that you guys would like to talk about or any ideas that you have or things that you were hoping to get out of this session that we can make sure happen? So I'm going to monetize your site. I'm going to talk more about that next time. Uh, so I'm doing it when I say next time. There's a second session called Blogging 201. Oh. Um, but um, as far as monetizing, um, you can put ads on the site. If you put on like Google's AdSense ads, they tend to be very small money. Um, to monetize your site, typically you need to get a focused readership, so you have to have a very clear topic that you're writing about. And then um, sometimes you need to solicit sponsorships from companies or build up a certain amount of traffic for people to notice. What happens, I notice, is that um, companies will contact you and say, I would like to put an ad on your site. But those companies seem a little fishy. I would never let anyone put an ad on my site because those ads then link somewhere else. I don't want to say that where I didn't feel confident in who that ad or advertiser was, um, because it brings down the quality score of your site in the long run. So for your $50 a year, which I often will pay, uh, offer to pay me not very much money, you actually have lowered your ability to show up in search ranks. So you kind of, it's a, that's a really high cost. Um, so, more interesting ways to monetize then are to be interesting enough to be able to have um, a merchandise option, like a t-shirt or something. Um, what I find is that people who are trying to make money from their site end up making money from some side thing. So for example, if you write a blog about some topic and then you um, sell services related to that topic. So the site itself isn't making as much money. Is there a specific situation that you're looking into? No, I'm just, um, and some general questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. Well, it's a good question. It's just, it, if you if you are, um, if you develop a certain voice, it's kind of like, you know, you're a columnist or something in, into the world, and people like your opinions about things, and you develop a steady readership, then those ads through the services like Google's AdSense, um, or through a system like BlogHer, for, um, women's blogs, they can bring in at least a, st a steady trickle of money which can be at least enough to cover the, your hosting and other fees. Um, if you're using WordPress.com as your hosting site, you have to be able to, uh, you have, to have a paid WordPress.com account to even be able to run ads. So um, if you're planning to do something like monetizing your site, you will probably end up having to host it yourself. And so that raises the cost and turns you almost a little bit into a business. It can be a good business, but if it takes as much work as almost being a journalist um, or um, a you know, a professional you know, writer. I want to ask about searchability. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not that interested in monetizing, mm -hmm. um, but um, so I spent the last, I guess, about two years just writing for me and my Facebook friends mm -hmm. who have started sharing it, uh, posts and stuff like that. Now I have readers in India. Oh, cool. Um, started it, and I don't remember how I did it, but when, when we started it, um, 
we kept the privacy um, controls pretty tight, mm -hmm. um, partly because we didn't know who we were talking to, and we wanted to just be careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, what is the what would you say about search? How do you open up search searches uh, so that your your blog is more searchable or more? So. Um, so the different um, blog services tend to have sort of a private and not private way of doing things. But, um, on WordPress.com, for example, you can say my site is um, private or just sort of not listed or public. So that's three levels. Private means someone has to have a password and be logged in to be able to see it at all. Um, sort of not listed means it's not really locked down, but it's, you're not telling anybody about it so much. And um, so it's more of a voluntary thing. Like Google's like, um, am I allowed to look at your site? No, okay, fine. But you know, but it's not like they could, people couldn't get in there. Yeah. And then public means Google can, sh can see your site. When I say Google, I mean any search engine. Can see your site and index it and decide how, how much they want to show up in search results. So you have those three levels. If you decide that you start to want to gather new readers, yeah. um, uh, there'll be tools in any of the different blogging and content management systems to do the various, and I'm going to talk about this in blogging too a lot more. I'll give you some more explicit stuff, and then if there's enough time, I'll show you in WordPress how. But we have enough time.